Okay, well, thanks for coming to the, today's uh, lecture um, series. It's included in the series of Becoming Ent Entangled 2. Um, very briefly, uh, to, uh, on our guest lecturer, tonight's lecturer, Professor Dr. Hemmings. Professor Dr. Uh, Jessica Hemmings writes academic and journalist texts on textiles. Her research uh, practice deals with subaltern readings of material culture knowledge and contemporary crafts. And presently, Do Professor Dr. Hemmings is teaching at, in HDK uh, Wahland in Sweden as professor of craft and working at the Research Center for Material Culture in Netherlands as a part of the Rita Bolland Fellow. And to give some examples on her diverse and big order, she's a co-editor of Passer Journal in 15th issue violence, materiality, and editor of the books, the textile reader, cultural threads, transnational textiles today, and the author of the book, Warp and Weft, Woven Textiles in Fashion, Art, and Interiors, which has been published by Bloomsbury. In today's lecture, Professor Jessica Hemmings is going to um, mention the relationship between academic research, art, and personal experience, and I would like to give this stage further on to <laughs> Jessica, uh, and um, please welcome her, yeah. Thank you very much for the, the introduction. And I have to say that I am amazed that we have a room full of people <laughs> on a Friday night, a dark Friday night in the, in the winter time. So, uh, gold stars for, for commitment to everyone. I would have had my pajamas on hours ago <laughs> if I'd been in Sweden today. <laughs> so I, I hope I can, uh, I can keep us uh, awake for, for as long as needed before, um, before the rest of your, your Friday evenings can, can unfold. Um, as Elbru said, this, this talk is about, um, I suppose started because of something that I'm often asked about, which is um, the possibility or the discomfort with using the first person in PhD writing, which is most of my um, work at Hordecor and in other universities is PhD supervision. And my own education was both in textile design but also in literature, and so I suppose I I'm representative of um, artistic research um, in that I come from a mixture of, of disciplines and maybe unlike slightly more conventional academic disciplines, I don't have, um, I don't have any anxieties about I. <laughs> um, but that's not really what, so much what this talk is about. That's uh, a question that made me realize that um, for a very long time, I was a diligent academic. And I, um, I went through the motions of what, not what people were ever explicitly telling me was wrong or right about academic work, but somehow exists in the air, exists in the atmosphere, or they're myths that we don't, don't debunk, or somehow we, we absorb them, but we can't remember the person that said, but it must be like this and not, not like that. And only quite recently starting to, to realize that if I can't remember the place where I was told I had to do it that way, then maybe it's time to change. Maybe, maybe I don't need to... Um, to feel so pressured by some of these assumptions. And I think, of course, artistic research is maybe the place where some of these risks are a lot more welcomed than, than other, other areas. Um, so indulge me, because this is about me. I'm sorry. Um, but it's about me in, in the hope that you hear yourselves or some, some, some echo of, of yourselves in this and that, that maybe uh, what I have taken so very long to arrive at is something that you could shortcut a little bit more more easily because this idea that work that we spend so very, very much of our time, including winter Friday evenings doing, to hold it so separate from the rest of ourselves seems bizarre. I mean, it, it seems so, so artif artificial. Um, 
So I begin. Um, and I would welcome questions at the end, but I do have some lights on me, but if you want to jump up and down and wave your arms midstream, we can try and take questions as we go as well. I won't, I won't at all, I won't be offended. Um, but I, I, I show you this because um, this is me. Um, between the, uh, the split in the tectonic plates in Iceland, a pretty amazing um, dive, dive site, and also an incredibly cold dive site, where you can actually move, move between the plates that are, that are spreading apart. But I show you this not because we are here to talk about scuba diving tonight, but because this is a person who likes silence and a person who actually is deeply uncomfortable collaborating. Um, there is a photographer, of course, it's incredibly dangerous to dive alone. You don't ever, I don't think you ever dive alone. So although this image suggests something solitary, there is a dynamic with, with another person for safety reasons. But beyond that, this is an environment that I thrive in, that I have sought out and that, that I find exceptionally inspirational. And I think that this is really at odds with what we are, um, I feel quite pressured to understand as the expectation of an academic life and an academic researcher, which is really gregarious, always together with lots of people, um, sharing all of these wonderful ideas all the time. And the only way we're going to get more ideas is sparking off each other. And I am not like that. I'm very solitary. I'm also a long distance runner. I really find that my brain functions when I'm alone. And my brain does something else when I'm doing this. And it's, it's functioning, but it's not, um, it's not doing what I need for my research practice. And I think that this is a little bit of a, a myth also in, in academia, that somehow we always benefit from being together with each other all, all the time. So I just hold this up as a little bit of, a, of an extreme, that this is not your ideal academic <laughs> in today's society, somebody who doesn't want to talk <laughs> and doesn't want to collaborate. And these are things um, that we then have to find ways to, to balance or, or navigate. This is where um, I began, so I can uh, uh, date myself from showing you slides. I started um, my education in woven textile design, and I was incredibly happy as a, as a weaver. I didn't, um, I didn't think that I was studying the wrong, wrong thing, except along the way I was also introduced to post-colonial literature, and as a child I had lived in Indonesia and I had found education my childhood education to be excruciating. I absolutely, absolutely hated school. Um, I also had missed a lot of it, so it probably wasn't the, the best combination for someone who wasn't very quick to then also have a lot of disruption in their education. But something happened to my brain when I began to learn how to weave, and it could have simply been serendipity, some timing, but I was also introduced to literature, which was now about places that I had, I had experienced, I had first-hand knowledge of, and I fell in love with writing. And I fell in love with writing, I really firmly believe, because it is built much like you build up textiles, and after being such a terrible um, student that was always looking for reasons not to go to school, I somehow locked onto something that allowed me to make a transfer. And the, the first started with this passion for materials, but then somehow swapped over to words. Um, and, I, and I say that because I think that people as, assume that um, um, there's, there's something that has always flown very, very, flowed very seamlessly in, in people's thinking or education bef before they reach academic work, and mine was exactly the opposite. The idea of going to university was the first, furthest thing from my mind and most certainly surprised my family. <laughs> but this is, this is my material now. I mean, this, this is the thing that I play with and the thing that I think through. I need to write to know what I'm thinking. And I say this with some caution because I know that a lot of practice-based or artistic PhDs don't necessarily have that type of relationship to writing. And I have to also acknowledge that I write in the one language that I know, 
Um, so that there are, are some significant differences. But I really do believe that that transfer of a way of thinking in one material over to another material is, can be really useful for the types of um, domains that we're, that we're working with. But I told you I was dutiful. Um, and so like all, all good academics, I, I planned events. And Elberus mentioned I do actually have a real interest in what sometimes is um, called in a very pejorative sense, journalistic writing. Um, I, um, I like writing for uh, a much broader audience. It has a speed to it that never happens in an academic context and is, is very motivating if you're also working on, on slow, slow academic um, projects. But what I started to wonder about with these types of projects was when when should I be writing? When should I be curating? Um, when, when should I be speaking? There was a time when I was satisfied with just, just being busy, just saying yes to absolutely everything. Um, but it, it reached a bit of a, of a light bulb moment here when I had to reflect on the fact that um, I, I organized a symposium, a very typical task that we would do in these types of contexts. And from that, decided to work on a book that was also about different types of experimental practice. Um, and people have, on many occasions, told me how wonderful that book would have been if it was an exhibition. And I'm not stupid. I know that they're also saying it's not a very good book. <laughs> it's fine. Um, this is what I had to reflect on in this talk um, that crossed, crossed over between writers and, and the, the museum sector. But it started to make me think a lot more recently about when, when do we use these materials in different, in different formats? And what was it about that book that should have been an exhibition and, and not a writing exercise? And why did it... Why did it take me so long to figure that out? Or did I need to write the book before I could have realized that actually it should have existed as physical material rather, rather than words? Um, the opposite then happened a few years later where a book, the Cultural Threads book, became an exhibition um, after the fact, but an exhibition with material specifically that could travel because I didn't have, um, really did not have funding. And so you can notice that many of these textiles are printed and fold down quite easily. And I was able to move the exhibition around the world precisely because um, these things were so, so transportable. Um, and that made me realize that actually, possibly, I, I had said in the book that I was fascinated with transnational textiles because they move so easily. But I hadn't lived that. I, I said that because it's a really nice sentence to write. And somehow, even I, when I was perfectly happy with the book, didn't fully comprehend what I was saying until I actually tried to move these things around the world and marveled at the fact that a suitcase, enough, that can be my exhibition. It's, it, it, they really do move in ways that even I don't think the words had, had taught me. And so you can, you can hear me realizing that I'm, um, I'm, I'm starting to, I love writing, but I'm starting to, to realize when it, um, when it rubs up against other types of knowledge that I have to keep reminding myself to trust. So I mentioned that it is true, I, I take, the academic risk of using time for popular culture writing. Um, and it's because I find it satisfying. I tend not so much to write about um, practices that are very well known, because I'm not sure I um, need to be yet another contributor to that. So I find the satisfaction maybe more in writing about people that are less known. Um, but this isn't even even more difficult academic risk that I've taken, and that's the, the genre of writing exhibition reviews is something that I'm really, really passionate about. 
And for those of you that have fallen far enough down the academic rabbit hole, you might have already realized that an exhibition review isn't particularly worthy um, if you work in universities that have any type of point counting system. You know, it, it really is the, um, uh, uh, the nil point exercise. Um, so I, um, I talk about the fact that it's remained a, a personal interest, even though it's not um, visible inside many academic systems. Um, an outcome that doesn't count in the machine of academic bibliometrics, a nil point entry in our ever more pressured academic environments of knowledge production. Practically, it's an unwise genre for an academic to even claim as a professional commitment. This, this, the system is okay, it gives a little bit of space to it, but, but doesn't really recognize it in any of the mechanisms that set our budgets, which aren't so important, except they set our time, and so they're hugely, hugely important. Um, but I really have to hold on to this last sentence because I think it's something um, when I said that I wanted to talk about the personal that we don't talk about enough in research. And that's that I just enjoy writing these things. <laughs> that's why I do them. And we, I think, need to really give ourselves so much more space to say, I need to do this because I really enjoy it, because it makes me incredibly happy. Um, I, I recognize that at different points in people's career, these, these trade-offs and these risks are more or less tolerable. Um, but in the example of this, so for several decades, I chipped away at these exhibition reviews because I found them fun um, to work on. And then I, um, I converted them, you could say, into a, um, a journal article, a, 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 an overview of all of those reviews, trying to understand a particular thing, which is that textiles are pretty, pretty um, misbehaving creatures in the white cube of the, of the gallery. And so what are the different ways that they're installed? So this was not about curation. It was entirely about the different strategies people use to, to install textiles um, in the hope that more attention to this might, um, might improve some of, some of the qualities that, um, that people try to, try to work with. And I, I made grand statements about the fact that I really only write reviews about things that I have physically seen. And then when I condensed um, this down into a journal article, again, it was, it was about my bodily experience in those spaces. I have a massive issue with top right for any of you that are interested. I try not to uh, actively pick on other people's curation, but for exquisite historical quilts, that's the, the most disrespectful way I can possibly imagine to, to present them, and I will probably never get press images from that gallery again. <laughs> um, uh, but so, so this, so although I said that the, um, the exhibition review gets no, no points, no credit inside our system, I, I then did this conversion exercise to make this into a journal article and pull, pull together all of that time that I had already spent at a, at a moment actually when I, when I was pretty um, cash poor on research time otherwise. So it's, it's a, a harvesting exercise. And I'm strict about what, what I will include. They're eclectic, they're not necessarily high profile, but the importance was my body. That I was in those spaces, I could talk about what happened when the wind blew through the door, that working only from, from images was a real, real travesty and a, um, a, a step that couldn't, couldn't be taken, and this was, um, this was what, what was important. To write without having stood within the gallery space presents a danger I cannot risk. Rather than claim to be more comprehensive than is honest, I will claim instead the crucial importance of first-hand experience of viewing the exhibition. This is printed in 2019. It's out, it's online, it's in the journal. And um, 
and we have a pandemic. And I'm not actually viewing many exhibitions anymore. <laughs> um, and I faced this problem of wanting to do that thing that I liked, which was write exhibition reviews. And I am deep in lockdown in, in Spain, where we were really not moving at all. And I wondered what, what to do, knowing that this great statement of Jessica Hemmings is already sitting, bearing down on my shoulders. Um, in very early 2020, I had um, seen this exhibition uh, by, by accident. I know the, the artist, I followed the artist's work, but in all honesty, I was walking by the gallery at, at night and noticed the work. I went back in the next day very briefly and had a look. So, so brief was my look that I spoke to him afterwards and said, you know, why did you um, include all of the paint on the yellow textile. I've never seen you overprint on your woven cloth. And he was able to say, it's not, it's not overprinted at all. Um, it's, it's a um, uh, paper fiber that's in the weave. I'm saying this because my viewing was really um, circumspect. I was, I, was, I was, my head was in the clouds. I was thinking of other things. And equally, this is an artist who I had um, been able to do a studio visit with in the prior year, another person whose work I had followed for some time. But this now, my body went into that exhibition space, but my brain was somewhere else. I might have had too much wine the night before. It was not a high concentration moment on my part. I wasn't even seeing the correct things. My eyes were not awake. This work, okay, I had physically seen some of it, but in the context of a studio visit, I'm then sent images of the, of the exhibition, an interesting artist called Anne, Anne Wilson from the, from the US, um, who works with embroidery on these really very, very dramatically different scales. Um, so those dots on the background are, are embroidered and um, ink flecks, and then the bigger dots you can actually see just above the chair the right-hand chair, then that becomes the detail I show you. Um, and now I'm grounded, <laughs> and I decide I want to write exhibition reviews. Um, so I decide the best thing I can do is um, acknowledge that, that we have to adapt this genre now, including all of those great things I've said in the past. Um, so I have to introduce it by saying, um, by acknowledging the, the facts um, if we asked about the sky, is Anne Wilson, the more recent images you just saw, those are memories of work I saw during a pre-pandemic studio visit, and then her speaking about what it was like to sit in those chairs and take one-by-one -one appointments during the, during the pandemic to, to talk about the exhibition, but also to have some small chance of community in a very, very controlled way. And then, as I said, um, Kusta Saksi's work, I, yeah, I was there, but I don't know, half my brain was definitely not, not there, um, because I wasn't there with the agenda at that time of, of writing, writing about it. Something which does really work for my, my, how awake my brain is. Um, and so then I have, to, um, I have to make a really massive adjustment, which, which frankly blows out of the water <laughs> the article I'd published only a year, year before. Um, I break with the conventions of an exhibition review. I didn't see one of them in person, and the other one I didn't have, have the project in, in mind. And it's not even objective. Because of those things, I decide to contact both art artists and ask them to read my writing before it is published, which is something I would not do when it comes to an exhibition review. I would do it with other types of writing, but never an exhibition review. But because the all of the rules of the game had changed so much, I, I decided I had to, to change these ones as well. And so then I, I leave with the explanation that the compromises, if this is what we have to call them, represent my effort to come to terms with the extent of isolation and loss 2020 delivered, I was writing at the time, has delivered. Um, it's an adaptation of the genre of the exhibition review, an attempt to make do with what remains possible today. Um, and in some ways, I've realized that doing that loosened many of the rules 
as I said, I, I can't tell you who told me these rules because nobody did, but somehow I've, I've absorbed them as, as part of an unspoken working culture. So this idea of academics changing, changing their minds is a, is a really tough, tough one, particularly when we, when we publish, um, because publishing somehow sort of fixes things in, in time. And I have some massive reservations about my own PhD and what, what I, how, far I, um, how far I pushed um, the arguments that I was trying to make, the extent of the, of the claims. Um, and so this is a similar type of, type of writing strategy. And I, I must admit, this is not because I'm um, particularly contrary in always trying to write back to, to opposites, but I want to to show it to you because it's survivable. <laughs> so a decade after, after my PhD, I have to realize that what I want to write is that those claims were too, too much. Um, and I think in general, many of our claims are a little bit inflated. And would we sometimes be better served by making some, some small claims and, and finding them well balanced and, and sufficient um, my interest in smallness is driven by a desire to make reasonable claims on behalf of craft's power in an era when modest impact feels like an unwelcome truth in academic research. Um, and I think that most of the, the time, particularly someone whose job is called the professor of craft, it seems like I'm, um, I'm, I'm playing on the wrong side if, if what I'm doing is writing about all the things that craft can't do. But in this particular piece of writing, I was trying to, to flag up that in certain economic circumstances, this really inflated idea of craftivism changing people's lives is nonsense. It's actually really disrespectful for the, for the economic and the social circumstances that, that people are living in. Um, and so I, I sort of come up again with this, this sort of awkward idea that, that maybe it's the limitations of what something can do that, that, that are part of its identity as, as well. Um, and if I'm going to say that, then I, then I have to acknowledge this close reading has required me to totally revise, I didn't say totally, but totally revise the importance I'd placed, particularly in Zimbabwean fiction, which was what I worked on for my, for my PhD, the place of textiles in their storytelling and instead understand to recognize that craft, what craft is unable to repair and recover are also components of its identity. And I, and I do that, I suppose, as a little bit of a, of a counter, counterbalance, um, not because things out there aren't incredibly sincere, but what um, we are unable to change can also be a legitimate component of craft's identity. So I mentioned that I wrote my own PhD in a literature department, and it was about a, um, a Zimbabwean author, she is not alive now, but called Yvonne Vera. She died as a, a relatively young, young woman. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm obsessed with her writing, as I think most, most PhDs have, have a, a little thread of that. She didn't write very much, and she was alive during my, um, the time I wrote my PhD, and so I didn't, I didn't ever think that this was work I would move away from because she was publishing quite quickly. Um, and she passed away at the end, co totally coincidentally, at the, at the end of when I was working on the, on the PhD. Um, but more recently, I've, um, and I had a really tough time um, at my exam. Um, I told Andrea last night that, um, that my supervisor did fall asleep during my, my viva. Okay, in, in Britain they're not a public event, but nonetheless it wasn't so warming to the heart to look over for that real smile of you can do it <laughs> and, and find that, um, that I thought it was a really heated argument, but, but some people weren't even awake in the room. <laughs> um, but, but part of that tension was about how a, a political reading of, of uh, Zimbabwean literature and if there really was space for other types of analysis, creative analysis. 
I, I wanted to say that these textiles were speaking and saying the things that female characters were otherwise un unable to say. And so this sat with me badly for a very long time, and I think I can probably say I actually just ran away from it. I finished the PhD and I retreated back into the textiles, which welcomed, welcomed me much more, more kindly. And then, of course, after a while, it just started to eat at me, as all, all good things that you run away from do. Um, and in fairness, an archive opened, an archive of um, some documents of, of Yvonne, Yvonne Vera's in, in Canada. And so the access to the, the archive um, was a little bit like a, a red rag that I couldn't, I couldn't turn, turn away from. And so I, um, I decided to try and understand much more her as a writer and a, um, a, a creative thinker than the political analysis of uh, the content of her writing that I had, frankly, done a pretty poor job of delivering in my own PhD, in part because I thought that wasn't the only way she deserved to be treated. And when she was interviewed, she often um, wanted to celebrate much more abstract creative aspects of her work than um, the, inter the political interpretation that, that many people were, were interested in, in reading, reading into it. But the part that I, um, I think is another example of this, where, where did I get this idea that good research would mean sort of having this, um, this fist-tight control over, over my material and what I, was, what I was saying, actually came through the inspiration of another person who also worked on Vera for her PhD, a woman called Sarah Kastner. Um, and I have to acknowledge that her efforts, she was the person that, um, that worked on the, on the archive and pulled, pulled together the funds that Yvonne Vera's um, estranged husband donated without her knowledge um, to, to the library, um, admittedly, after her death, but there, her death was not unexpected and there would have been opportunities to, I think, to have understood whether the author wanted this material made public, and that was not something her, her ex-husband chose, chose to address during, during her lifetime. So I went there with guilt. I felt like I was being a voyeur. I was being a voyeur. Um, and it's, it's a very complicated archive from that, that respect, and I went with a lot of discomfort that um, I, I would have preferred her to know <laughs> what, what I was reading. Um, but it's this last part about control, which I think is what I have had to realize. It goes back to that exhibition review example as well, that 2020 was different from 2019. So you can want to have as much control as, as whatever you want in the world, and it's not going to work, Jessica. You're going, you're going to have to adjust and, uh, and adapt. And so... Kaysner actually even al analyzes one of Vera's own characters in a book called Under the Tongue um, and talks about the fact that her characterization through the novella as a desiring subject with a profound belief in her own reality. This character wants to train to be a nurse um, at a time when that would not have been possible in Zimbabwe as a black woman. And so she's out of chronological sequence with what is, what is possible in, in the story unsettles a culture of reception in which the reader is positioned to claim a kind of mastery over the life narrative presented. And when I read this, I realized that I would be able to write about the fact that Vera gives us all of these different explanations for what she's doing. And I would also be able to write about my changing explanations for what I'm doing, that maybe we don't have a... Uh, um, we have a care over these things, and we have a, um, a respect and responsibility for them, but mastery, control over them, um, doesn't change the fact that in 2019 I said I'd never write an exhibition review that wasn't about standing with the materials, and in 2020 had, had to make, make that adjustment. But I'd still forgotten someone. Um, this is the person that I thought as a young 
as a teenager, th this is the life I thought I was heading, heading towards. Um, so th these things are creeping towards an interest in embodiment. I'm standing in the gallery. I'm, I'm realizing that I don't have control over everything. Um, but nonetheless, professionally, I think I'm still relatively diligent and academic, and, um, and this, this person is gone. This person who needed an exceptionally high level of physical risk in their life to not be bored. Um, and, um, and a person who did, did not do much decision making up here, but did a huge amount of instinctive um, embodied decision making all, all the time. And I, I wondered why that person had to go so far away from who I am today. Um, what, what is it about that knowledge that I had had when I was skipping school all, all the time and never planning to go to university? Did, is there any space for her to, to come back into Zimbabwean literature, textiles, these other things that I decided to do, to do with my, my life. Um, so I've, I've tried it more, more recently um, to, to understand that that is not the knowledge of the academy, that is not, um, that is not the typical knowledge that we, we discuss in art schools, but maybe in some ways it's um, ways that I work that are um, more ingrained in me than anything, anything else, any other, any other types of, of knowledge. So I started to become interested in uh, examples of learning how to do something where if you um, got it wrong, the stakes were very high. So that's not the craft department where I work. The stakes are pretty low. We can blow up the kiln and that would be bad and we can um, misthread the loom, and that is just annoying. Um, but I looked at um, learning to land an aircraft, not, not take off, that's not so hard, but um, there's an ex my father was a pilot, there's an expression between pilots that it's much better to be down here wishing you were up there than up there wishing you were down on the, on the ground. You've got, to, you've got to get back down safely. Um, and it's about hand-eye coordination. I looked at um, uh, avalanche rescue uh, teaching and the different ways that snow conditions are, are um, judged before deciding whether you would go um, back, back, country, back country skiing. And I looked at um, other things about horses that in, include a, a huge um, amount of, of dexterity. And as I said, things that actually make my heart beat a little bit faster. Um, and all of that other work in those years before, it does other things. I'm quite proud of some of those exhibition reviews and some of them are nice, but it didn't actually do much to my heartbeat. Um, and, and so I, um, it's, this is not life writing. The, the, all of the examples I chose, I must admit, I have some type of tangential experience with, um, but it's not my life writing, and I, I chose not to be the subject, and maybe that's an odd thing to, to hear when considering that I told you this talk was about the personal, but I suppose that was this academic space that I brokered. I just, I, I'm not there yet. I'm, I have every respect for autoethnography. I'm not in the anti-autoethnography anti club, although I know it's a big one. Um, but but I, I, I think I need to be some, some, or I'm still trying to understand where I should be, and I'm at the moment thinking it should be some, somewhere else. So for the solution for this became the memoir. Um, people's voices of learning to um, land an aircraft, look at snow conditions, um, and even, I don't know if some of you might be familiar with the Ken Loach film book and then film Kez, which has these um, extraordinary scenes of him flying a hawk to a lure, which requires a huge amount of dexterity and hand-eye coordination. It's very similar to lunging a horse, which if you get it all wrong, you could just end up tied in knots in this huge long piece of string with a very annoyed animal at the, at the end of it. 
Um, these are two versions of the film. A number of versions have been made. And I mean, this is me. This is how much I disliked the classroom. N none of it, none of it made sense in, in any way. And there's a, a wonderful moment in this film when um, Ken Loach is quite famed for really um, some very necessary criticism of a number of things about Britain. At this time, it was the education system and a very harsh young examination system that, that streamed people in different directions really early um, in their educations. More recently, he's, um, he's done other harrowing, harrowing films also about social issues. Uh, but this character has one teacher who is, um, doesn't fail him. And this teacher asks him what, um, what he's interested in, and he has taken a, um, a kestrel bird out of a nest. Officially a totally illegal thing to do to wildlife, I should add. But he has stolen it and is, and is training it. And um, when the, the teacher has the sensitivity to ask him, can you tell us something about this? All of a sudden, this enormous vocabulary, he talks about the swivel, the leash, all of this um, language around falconry that he's taught himself from stolen books because his family doesn't, doesn't have any, any money to support him. And he comes, he absolutely comes alive. So it's those types of, um, of moments where the conventions of education are completely breaking, breaking down, and another type of intelligence is, is fully alive that I, that I work on in, in that, in that piece, of, piece of writing. Um, because you can already hear, it's, it comes very, very close to, to my own heart. But also because of this idea of um, risk. Because if, if there are still doubts that that type of embodied knowledge has a place in the arts. Um, I think that we really need to look to these, these other education disciplines where you could go out into avalanche conditions or you could not land your aircraft and their ideas of trusting that type of knowledge are um, watertight. There is, no, there is no doubt that that is how that knowledge is working. Okay, you have survived me. <laughs> I just have a few, a few um, different examples to shift to in this, in this second part. Um, so you're doing, you're doing well on, on Friday night. I can not see too, too many nodding heads yet. Um, I mentioned that the reason why I showed you that, that picture in the water is um, because I think we do need to talk about silence. Um, and we do need to talk about wanting to work alone and where we're allowed to say that in an academic context at the moment when so many things are about this will be better if you collaborate with this, this other person. Um, and I think part of it comes down to how we understand what introversion and extroversion are. Um, and Susan Cain is a, um, an American writer. She has a big TED talk um, as, as well if, if anybody's interested. But she makes it really clear that introversion and extroversion is, is absolutely nothing about our capacity. It's about how we gain and lose energy. And I think this is really important inside a, a, a PhD study or really any type of study, because if we work in ways that are absolutely always draining down our batteries, um, it's not sustainable. It's, it's not healthy, or as I even said at the beginning, could, could we even acknowledge that maybe it's not fun? <laughs> and not fun is not really very nice either. Um, and so she refers to her definition of introverts simply lose energy when they're with people and extroverts gain energy. Um, that doesn't mean that introverts can't be compelling public speakers. That doesn't mean that ext extroverts don't do things alone. It's how you, um, how, how you balance your battery chargers, wherever you think your battery chargers are. I don't know why I think they're here. But, um, and, and then she talks architecturally, and this is, a, this is a tough one for me because I work in a, in a, in a faculty that's um, designing its new art school you know, with open plan offices and everything's going to be shared. And 
I just want to cry. I just sort of think, oh my goodness, maybe I could sit in the toilet and write. Or I mean, wh wh where do I live in that type of place? Or I, it's Sweden, coffee's so expensive. I can't just be in the coffee shop the whole, like I, I, need, I need a corner to, or my, my, that brain that thinks in water won't think in an open plan office. I, I know this all, already. We don't need to test me or I, I promise you it won't work. Um, and so she talks about the fact from, from young school children, it is very American in its emphasis, so um, maybe not applicable here, but through to workplaces, this idea of how we physically organize ourselves assumes that we are all one type of personality. Um, and she says, collaboration became a sacred concept, and I really do firmly believe this in research funding at the moment, and it's, and it's something that, um, that I wonder how, how we can possibly re-tip this, because the idea is that the more you collaborate, a key multiplier for success. Um, but she says, then physically we started to build things so they were only about collaboration, not only online, but in person. We failed to realize that what makes sense for the asynchronous, relatively autonomous interactions of the internet, and this is pre-pandemic, but, but interesting that she's already recognizing that, that how we interact online is totally different than in person, might not work as well inside the face-to-face, -face, politically charged, acoustically noisy confines of an open plan office. And then this is a, a myth, a myth also that's often pushed on women, I think, more, more, than, more than anyone else. Um, but this idea of multitasking is really switching back and forth between multiple tasks, which reduces productivity and increases mistakes by up to 50%. Um, and I think that, th that this is an interesting um, warning for all of us when we think that, um, as I did in those early slides, being busy was a really clever thing to be. <laughs> and maybe I needed to do that because I had been so deeply, deeply unclever when I was a child. Maybe it was a fine phase to go through. Um, but, but this idea that, yes, yes, trying to do a ton of different things at the same time is possible, but what about if you want to get into a depth of work? That, that, is, that is incompatible, I, I, I think, for most people. And then the last thing seems like we're crashing on a downer here, but, but, I, but I, hope, I hope it doesn't sound like this. I, I should take the slide down. How can I possibly uh, save this now <laughs> um, that this isn't a downer? Um, how, do we, um, how, do we, how do we turn failure around? And I'm, I'm not trying to be some, some type of... Um, um, motivational speaker here, um, but as I said, the irony of me publishing what had, I'd actually worked on for quite a lot of time about those exhibition reviews, only to just 12 months later realize I had to write something completely different. I think that we need to be a lot more generous with each other about what these, some of these secrets are, um, because I think once you know people that are working in research, um, if you know them well enough, you know how many peer reviews um, they've received that were rejections. You, you do know their problems, but you only know that through a quite a deep level of friendship. The rest looks like this surface, wonderful mirage of, of seamless um, floating work. And it just, I don't think it is. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're out there. I, I do know one or two of them, annoyingly. But, um, but not most, not, not really mere mortal human people. Um, but, but we don't, so we talk about it in friendship, but we don't talk about it professionally, often. Um, but this is a, an English colleague who's based in Ireland, an exhibition of a, a textile that was made as a huge community project that was attacked by the, by the press. It had received City of Funding, um, city of Culture funding for the city of, of Cork just before the economic crash in Ireland. Um, so there was a lot of scrutiny over why, why would knitting and why would women, why would older women receive so much money to, to sit around and knit. It was a bit, a bit of a witch hunt. Um, and she goes back a little bit like me, maybe a decade is a, a trigger point on these things. She goes back later and writes, writes about it, tries to understand 
um, what can be salvaged from a really bruising experience of on the one hand having this great great funding and on the other hand the, the public reception of it being very very damning um, this writing is a navigation of failures the safe channels in an estuary are marked by buoys keep the red to port and the green to starboard and you'll travel safely but I'm compelled by the spaces outside of the publicly marked and I wonder if it's possible to make it to harbor by other routes. Such heretic navigation promises possibility, but failure looks under the surface. She talks about the person that she collaborated with and how in the, the structures of many of the residencies they'd done, their very experimental work made a lot of sense and it really crashed into a miscommunication when it went out as a, as a community project. Um, one, of the, um, one of the biggest issues was the basic idea that this was described as a map because the color and the knitting patterns were dictated by data feeds of weather and traffic patterns in the, in the city. But many of the people who volunteered to participate in the project understandably thought a map would be a, a, a different type of map. A map would have streets that they, that they recognized. And so there was this massive language, language slip. Um, and so she talks about the fact that those types of abstractions were really common, probably also really common inside this room, but what happens when our, our academic work travels out? And so she said, uh, Richard was her collaborator, the, the person who particularly worked on the data feeds. We were mistaken. Richard and I brought our nuanced collaborative skills to the Knitting Map TKM project and watched as it slowly failed. Invisibly but palpably more popularly accepted structures of relating made themselves felt. We began to understand that what we did was not that understandable. And then she talks about the difference with working with a, a community rather than the, her, her academic colleagues. Our failure was to assume we could collaborate with a city and a community using the skills we'd used honed in retreats of a contemporary art practice. Community is messy and disorderly, as are the cities that they compose. We came to accept that what happened during our year of knitting was the project. We came to accept that what happened during our year of knitting was the project, the, the, the labor rather, rather than the outcome, and eventually understand that such an audacious work could not have been completed without struggle and challenge. And then she tries to turn things a little bit around. Maybe it makes sense to speak of a pedagogy of failure rather than the failure of pedagogy. Um, but, but this, as I said, was a decade, a decade after the fact. Um, my last example is, um, is, a, is a different one, but it has similar, similar types of, of problems to it. So this is a project um, that was taken on by, by others. Um, when the person who initiated it wasn't able, able to, to finish it. Um, so there's um, something about, about hope and about breadth, and then also about losing control of the scale of a project. So it ended up um, being a series of books which were um, meant to map all of the different ways that applique, a certain textile technique, emerges around the world. So this is the type of textile um, that, uh, that was being researched. And the editor who inherited the project, um, and this may seem very disembodied, taking on someone else's project, but I think sometimes we even end up, I feel like I inherit earlier versions of my own projects. That writing I have to rewrite is me now fighting with myself. In this case, it is different people. Malasha can candidly explains the project began as an earnest scholarly effort to find a traditional, to document traditional applique that was still made around the world. It ended with a motley array of writings, a few chapters by the author, a random assortment of field notes based on encounters, Contributors, con contributions from others assigned to continue when Nell's declining health forbade further tra travel. 
Um, and then I, uh, we've got, I haven't used the word audaciously in about two years, and then I noticed that we have two audaciouslys in, in these slides here. It was clearly my, my word, of, word of the moment at the time. I reviewed those books, and I said that the project might have been audaciously large, but it was sincere. Uh, most of the authors refer to doubts, doubt that they handle the social situation adeptly, doubt that too much or too little compensation was paid or bartered for the textiles they collected on Nell, the original researcher's behalf, doubt that their journeys had taken the right paths out of so many to choose from. I am struck by how much more useful these encounters will be to students than the impossibly rational accounts of research peddled by how-to methods publications awash in arts education today. I think you can tell I'm not so keen on the how to write a PhD books. Because what, what this collection exposes is um, all of those forks in the road. Um, and whether they're coming from a, a, a single person sequential research or in this case a crossover when somebody wasn't able to, to continue, um, I think that that's a very, very large part, a very personal part, an embodied part of how we do research that also gets dangerously silenced. Um, so I leave, I leave you with this. Um, the editor who did finish that project um, says that the trip that she undertook in, in order to finish it to Mongolia was an adventure that we would not have dared to choose for ourselves. And I wonder if we need to steal a little bit of that type of thinking sometimes for our own research and try to find ways to get ourselves into places where maybe something else allows us to dare to do something um, that is different than what I have been constantly alluding to that I can't put my finger on. All of these things in the walls of, of the university and the academy that, that make you think, I can't do it this way, or it needs to be big, or it shouldn't be in the first person, or it wouldn't be authoritative like this or that. Because maybe they're specters, you know, may, maybe maybe they're um, myths that get entrenched because we repeat them, but I, I can't find the original citation. <laughs> I don't know where they first came from. So I, I leave you with the hope that maybe you too take journeys that you might not have dared to even take for yourself. Thank you.